All right, good afternoon, Marine Corps Base Hawaii. We are here with Colonel Lightfoot, Commanding Officer of Marine Aircraft Group 24, with Sergeant Major Wells, Senior Enlisted Advisor for Marine Corps Base Hawaii, and uh, Holly Baptist, Director of Marine Corps Base Hawaii Commissary. Thank you all for being here and your time this Friday afternoon. Address some of the main concerns and topics that are kind of percolating through our information channel, so we're, we're very grateful that you're here to address some of those. So we'll go ahead and get started. First question is going to be for Colonel Lightfoot. So, sir, as the MAC-24 commanding officer, how has COVID-19 affected both MAC personnel, your aviation mission, and readiness? Okay. Well, first, let me just say, Major Martin, thank you for having uh, me and our uh, colleagues uh, up here. I definitely appreciate the opportunity to be able to address uh, any concerns, you know, uh, outside of the MAC, things that we work on daily. Uh, you know, one of the themes that I wanted to talk about quickly was just communication itself, and this is, you know, communication is a two-way street, and the only way it works is when we are talking to one another and working through our issues, and I would say it's ironic, you know, that here we have, you know, with a COVID uh, emergency and pandemic that's going on out there, um, it actually, when we need more communication, it's actually a little more difficult to actually do it, you know. Uh, when we used to be able to just take our entire unit and say, hey, let's form a school circle outside real quick, and I'm just going to pass the word uh, to everyone. Uh, that's not so easy to do anymore because of social distancing and all those things that we have to adhere to in order to not transmit the virus. So having a forum like this where we can probably reach a broader audience is definitely much appreciated, and I think it will help to, uh, to get that word out, you know, about what it is that we're doing, and then maybe uh, draw some questions and, and answer uh, anything else in the future as well. So I appreciate that. Also, want to just take a quick opportunity to thank uh, the team. You know, so so for Comstraft for setting us up for Marine Corps Base Hawaii uh, as part of we have kind of a triumvirate here, as we know, Marine Corps Base Hawaii, Third Marines, and Mag 24. There's more than that, but those are kind of the, we call ourselves the three amigos. You know, with Marine Corps Base Hawaii with Colonel Lyonez, uh and then with Third Marines with Colonel uh, Juarez, and then myself with Mag 24. Uh, this is a uh, I think it's a great team that we have here on Marine Corps Base Hawaii. Uh, these are uncertain times. You know, but uh, we know what to do, and we're doing it. And hopefully we're able to convey uh, that here today. So as far as uh, to your question, uh, I like to keep things pretty simple. Uh, so one of the things that I've learned over the years uh, from my senior leadership as I've uh, come up in the Marine Corps is uh, there's a term called uh, mission first, and people always. Uh, and I'll explain that just uh, very briefly. So mission first. Uh, as we know, in pre-MEF, and MAG-24 is a part of first Marine aircraft wing, which falls into pre-MEF. Uh, we need to be ready to fight tonight and win. That is our charter. That is what we are tasked to do. Uh, and that is basically for contingency operations in global instability. And we know that right now, uh, COVID-19 has caused global instability you know, out there. So more than ever, uh, the Marines and sailors and civilians of MAG-24 have to be ready to fight tonight and win. Uh, so that is something that is uh, paramount. We also have this added mission though. You know, where now it's, hey, now we're going to introduce COVID-19 and this threat, you know, into your mission. So now we have to add this, like, how are we going to be able to cope with the addition of COVID-19 to our ability to fight tonight and win? And then there's the implied mission uh, that goes with this, which is uh, DISCA, or Defense Support of Civil Authorities. Uh, how can we, and all the things that we have, help to support uh, not only our mission, but those around us. You know, so we have our military mission, and then we have civilian mission you know, that the state and our nation uh, require. So how can we use everything that we have to make sure that we accomplish the mission? So that's the mission first piece of this. And then the people always. So MAC-24 consists of around, well, just over 2,000 uh, Marines, sailors, and civilians. And that doesn't even include all the family members, of course, associated with that and support as well. Uh, and then we've also got about 86 aircraft uh, in support uh, equipment valued at roughly four billion taxpayer dollars. So we have a fair amount of people and equipment that we can uh, put towards this mission. And we want to be able to remain to do that. We have to be able to do that, but we can only do that uh, if our personnel are trained and ready. That's it, that's the only way we can do that. And by doing that, we have to remain COVID free. If we allow COVID to run rampant through uh, MAG-24, that will absolutely inhibit our ability to accomplish our mission. So that's the mission first piece and the people always. And then when you take the next step into that, it's like, hey, what is the risk 
what is the risk associated with the mission and COVID-19? And how has that impacted us? Well, there's really two ways that you have to look at it uh, within MAC-24. And obviously in Marine Aircraft 24, what we do is we fly. We fix and we fly aircraft in support of whatever the mission may be, which means we're basically moving uh, people or equipment from A to B in our aircraft. So there is a risk associated with COVID-19. It's persistent, it's highly contagious, uh, and it's a risk to all of our personnel and of course their families. And it can come in from anywhere. Uh, which is why we have a lot of these uh, travel restrictions in place. But then flight operations themselves, uh, we have to re remember the fact that flight operations inherently are risky as well. Uh, so what we have to do is find that, that right balance, and I believe we're doing it, but it is definitely a balance between what do we need to do to fight the COVID risk, but we have to maintain our ability to conduct safe flight operations. So that's the gist of the things that we are doing uh, I have to make sure that we are that we are doing that the right way with our seven subordinate units within uh, Mag 24. And as we know with flight operations, uh, it's not quite like riding a bike. You know, I mean, uh, you can't just hop in an aircraft and if you haven't ridden a bike in a while, you can hop on it and, and you're fine. Uh, more than likely, you just probably aren't going to do any of those tricks that you did maybe when you were younger. But in an aircraft, uh, that is a highly perishable skill. And there's a lot of different ways that we fly our aircraft and a lot of different mission sets that we've got. And when I think of it, it's you know, the, the more you fly, the more proficient you are at flying. The less you fly, the less proficient you are. Uh, so if we were to put all of our effort into fighting COVID-19 to reduce our flight operations to the point where we don't maintain currency and proficiency in the aircraft, well, the next time we get asked to go fly, uh, we now have a significant risk you know, in the aircraft. So we have to, again, find that balance where we fly the right amount and we're also ready uh, for the mission. So risk mitigation, uh, I think that we're doing some, uh, what, what everyone is doing basically, what, we're, what, we're, what we have in a lot of the policies and regulations that have been uh, uh, directed is destroy and deny COVID-19 uh, in our spaces uh, and in our squadrons. So we're disinfecting surfaces, we're washing our hands, we're maintaining social, dis social distancing, uh, we're wearing masks as appropriate. Uh, we're doing all those things, we're, we're shift, we have created shifts of personnel so that we reduce the footprint and the density of humans you know, in our areas so that we don't, we don't get too clustered around one another, we don't have any sort of formations uh, anymore, which as we know, Marines, we love formations, uh, but we have had to take that out of our lexicon at this point. Um, we do a lot of web teleconferencing, you know, and obviously like, this is a way right here, instead of having a, a theater full of people that we would be talking to right now, we said, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, and over at the squadrons and at the group headquarters, uh, we now use uh, DCS or we use web teleconferencing, you know, almost exclusively in the way just today. You know, I had, uh, you know, 100 people on the line as we were all talking about, you know, all the things that we need to do to maintain our ability to fight tonight and win. Go and do that with all the different squadrons, operations officers, maintenance officers, and so forth. So I think that we are a learning organization and we are adjusting appropriately. Uh, to that threat. And with our flight operations, I'll say that we are reducing our flight operations. So we have to be careful. Again, we don't want to reduce it too much, uh, but we're also not trying to break any records, you know, with, with the most flight hours per year type of thing. So we are indeed reducing our flight operations. We have increased use of the flight simulator, because uh, obviously the simulator, if, it's, if you crash the simulator, it's okay. You know, you can always just reset and say, let's try again. Uh, and then we're maintaining our day and our night currency. You know, so there are some mission sets I would say I would love to uh, be able to do more of, you know, uh, but uh, it just doesn't make sense at times. You know, and we rely on other agencies such as the ranges. You know, they're out there on the Big Island and other places. Uh, those are shut down right now you know, for obvious reasons. So there are some mission sets uh, that we have to be careful of uh, losing that uh, that capability for too long. And then the last thing is that we are indeed on 24/7 alert status at 9:24. So. Um, just as we have done in the past when there's volcanic eruptions you know, on the Big Island or when there's a tropical storm or a hurricane about to come through uh, and we put our aircraft, you know, in, uh, we, we keep them in a ready state and all of our personnel in a ready state 24-7, Monday through Friday, Saturday and Sunday, it doesn't matter what the time is. But if and when we get asked by uh, authorities, state or federal, uh, to launch in support of personnel, uh, then we will do that. Uh, we've all taken note to defend our country, uh, to give our lives if necessary, 
Uh, this isn't combat here, and I, and I won't liken it to it, but uh, we will put ourselves at risk in order to mitigate the risk to our fellow citizens. And I think that we all understand that as Marines, that that is what we are tasked to do, and that is what we will do uh, when asked to do so. I also want to take an opportunity uh, to just thank our families that are out there because uh, this is a pretty big adjustment, uh, not only to the way we're conducting our operations in the MAG, but we know that it's a big adjustment at home and on the home front, and there is no way that our Marines can focus on the task at hand without the support of their families allowing them to do that. I don't think they get enough credit for what they do, so I want to thank them for their continued support and patience as uh, we work through this. This is definitely a marathon and not a sprint. As we know, it's not going to end tomorrow. It's going to keep on going for, for some time now. And then finally, the enemy is watching. You know, everything that we do, we have to keep a close eye for. Not only is it what we do, what's the right thing to do, but the enemy is always watching us. So we have a responsibility to make sure our enemy knows that uh, we can cope with this. COVID-19 is tough. Uh, there are things that we have to do to mitigate the risk, but we can do it. We can absolutely do it, and we are ready. So we uh, maintain our ability to fight tonight and win. So I hope that answers your question, but that's my initial salvo. Yes, sir, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for that thorough response. Sergeant Major, over to you. So as the MCBA Senior Enlisted Advisor, can you give us a little bit more insight in terms of balancing the force's health and mission accomplishment for Blue Base Hawaii? Well, you know, sir, this seemed like a relatively easy answer, but now that I have to follow the gentleman from MAG 24, I'm not sure I'm up to the task. So uh, fortunately, he, he actually hit on a lot of things that I, that I thought about with this question. You know, we've all heard numerous commandants and sergeants major of the Marine Corps repeat the same message, and that message is always, as Marines, we have to be the most ready when the nation is the least ready. Well, what does that look like? Well, I'll tell you, you know, to echo the Colonel's remarks, the enemy's watching. I mean, we, you know, as Americans, we put everything in, in, the, in the public forum via our media, so everybody knows how the United States is reacting to COVID right now. What the unknown is, is how it's affecting the military. So our job, and, and when I say our job, I, I'm, I'm speaking to every single Marine, sailor, family member, service member out there, hey, our job is to maintain our personal readiness 100%. Absolutely 100%. That means you have to take every single precaution. Let me tell you why that is. I'm going to go a little bit the opposite way, because I don't know if you can tell by the accent, but you know, uh, hey, I grew up in a trailer, so I'm going to tell you a trailer story. When I was a kid, we used to squirrel hunt a lot. And in the, at the end of the year, you know, the uh, leaves would fall off the trees, and we had these... Uh, Hornets, where I'm from, and they build these really big nests about that big in trees. So as a kid with a shotgun, and yeah, we were kids with shotguns because this was Kentucky, uh, we would go find those uh, hornets' nests occasionally, and we'd, we'd start out by throwing rocks at them to see if any of the hornets were left alive because the hornets will die out at the end of the year. So we'd throw a couple of rocks to see if we could get some hornets to come out, and then eventually, like kids being dumb, one of us would shoot the nest with a shotgun. Now, if you were lucky, all the hornets had died already because the first big frost had come along. But this one particular day, me and my buddy Brian came upon the biggest hornet's nest I've ever seen. And we were maybe 30 or 40 feet from it, and it was up in the tree a little way. So we figured the hornets would never find us, even if they were in there. So my buddy Brian decided he was going to shoot it. So he shot this thing, and look, sir, I don't know how hornets locate people that far away. I don't know if they have x-ray vision or if they've got heat-seeking stingers. But listen... There was no question in our minds how ready those hornets were to respond to a crisis like some young fool shooting their nest with a shotgun. Because I'm telling you right now, thank goodness there was a, there was a uh, pond pretty close to us because it was absolutely a mad dash to get into that pond. And the water wasn't warm, but I tell you what, it was a lot more inviting than all them hornets circling over our heads. So in the U.S. military, that's what we have to be. We have to be those hornets in that nest. Even if you don't see us on the outside buzzing around, and we're certainly not outside buzzing around right now, you have to be ready to react at a moment's notice. Because, you know, to echo, uh, to echo what the Mickey Pack Commanding General says, you don't get to choose your battle. Some Marines fought on Iwo Jima, some fought on Guadalcanal, some fought in Vietnam, some fought at the Chosen. Right now, you and I have been called upon to fight COVID-19. So to assume that this is a lesser fight is a mistake. So be very, very wise with your decisions out there because it is everybody's responsibility to maintain that hornet-like readiness because the second you slack off, that's when the enemy will strike. So, Major, thank you. Yes, sir. 
are at Miss Baptist. For one, it's been amazing to see the MCBH uh, commissary team operating at such a high level at such an unprecedented time uh, during this COVID fight. Can you give us some insight into the daily operations at the commissary currently? So first of all, I'd like to thank you for giving the commissary the opportunity to speak here and address issues that um, a lot of our patrons have. Um, and also thank the community for their patience and support during this time. It means a lot. Um, there's a Chinese proverb that says, may you live in interesting times. And I believe we're all living in interesting times. And it's an opportunity that we have to step up to the challenge. So um, our, our critical mission is to deliver uh, groceries to the community, um, the commissary benefit. And um, currently, a lot of it is uh, business as usual. You know, uh, ordering the groceries, getting them to the shelf, delivering customer service. Um, but along with this has come a huge challenges with COVID. Um, the whole nation has, uh, the food supply has a, a strain on it, um, starting from um, the manufacturers to the transportation distributors and, and then directly at the retailers. So um, just to kind of give everyone an idea that um, last month, the commissary, we did 150% increase in sales. So the strain directly at the commissary um, was quite a bit. So our team was working to uh, get a hold of suppliers um, and, and get the shelves full. Um, everyone in the food chain is also seeing big strains in the workforce. You have uh, people who are at risk who aren't coming to work, um, people who are sick who are seeing at home, you know, taking precautions, being at home. Um, also in Hawaii and across the nation, you have children at home, um, so you have you know families that don't have support to take care of those children with the school closures. So that's affecting our workforce. Um, so um, some examples of uh, issues that we've had with supply, like unexpected issues that we've had with supply. Um, we're seeing it across the board. Uh, Starbucks is closed, so we have tea and coffee. Uh, you wouldn't expect, but the sales have just dramatically increased with that hair dye because salons are closed. Um, we've seen, you know, everyone's baking right now. So uh, yeast, 600% increase in sales. So those are the kind of challenges that the food supply chain are, are, are meeting. Um, and um, so that's that's just what, what we're doing to, to get groceries to the shop. And then um, as far as for patrons, what they're experiencing at the commissary, uh, we've had to adjust hours. Um, just to meet sanitation needs, um, increase sanitation. Uh, we're, we're um, you know, we have workforce issues where we, we're pulling, uh, we, we never did ID checks at the door, so that's that's a 60 hour a week job now that we're having to man at the door. We've also lost baggers, so we're pushing shopping carts. Um, and, um, and then, so we've adjusted hours to, to, meet, to meet the mission, so, um, some of the, the things that we're doing is we have the Kapuna hours. Uh, we have that Tuesday and on Saturday for from 9 to 10. And then for our patrons that can't make it on Tuesday and Saturday that still have would like to you know to come during those hours, we have available at the other three commissaries on the island, Kapuna hours Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So, so that's available to them if they can just keep in mind. We also have... Uh, we offer the, um, the dedicated time for the, 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 our men and women in uniform from every day from six to, um, I'm sorry, from four to six, four to five, I'm so sorry, uh, every day. So um, the other, the other uh, things that our customers are in, encountering are limits on some of the items. And initially we had to start with, you know, meat, uh, which we've been able to let the limits off on that as we were able to catch up with the, the supply demand on that. Um, so at, currently we we're just have limits on the paper products and some cleaning products. Um, but as, as you come in the commissary, our team has done a great job of sourcing, getting products to the shelf. So that it, it is very limited. Um, you know, there there's every day we have toilet paper. We get deliveries six days a week. Um, so. Uh, I believe that customers are getting what they need at the commissary. And um, 
And then another thing that it was implemented on April 10th is the wearing of masks. So, um, so, so if patrons come to the commissary, they just need to have a mask available that as they go in, that they're ready to wear. Um, uh, another thing that's going on in our operation is our human resource team and our DLA that does our, our manning and um, all of our, our uh, staffing, they, they've been working over the, over, around the clock, I'm sorry. So they're teleworking from home on computers. Um, you know, I've been talking to them. A lot of them are putting in three, four hours of overtime daily just to get the commissary staffed. So the commissary has stepped up and, and uh, started doing critical hires. So we can do critical hires, get people on board relatively quickly um, than normal without, you know, we bypass some of the, um, the normal hiring processes um, and are doing some critical hiring. Um, unfortunately, uh, for our location, um, we're losing our contractor. So this was already in place since, since October. Um, we were losing our contractor who does our custodial, our stocking, and our warehousing. So um, that is going to become government uh, assumed responsibilities May 1st. So while we're doing the critical hiring, we also, the critical hires that we are hiring that, that we've been able to bring on board are going to be replacing those. So the relief is kind of unknown as far as how much relief will that offer. So we're, we're working on 30, but our, our human resource team um, out in Fort Lee and then the DLA team has done an outstanding job in supporting us through that. And um, so anyway, but I'm sorry. <laughs> and so, um, you know, we, we're getting a lot of support from our headquarters, from other agencies, and um, our team has done a great job in stepping up and these are kind of the things that we're, we're going through at the commissary. Thank you, Holly. All right, so back over to Colonel Lightfoot. So, sir, as you mentioned, aviation missions continue to, to happen. So, from your standpoint, how are the pilots, the crew, and the gear being safeguarded against uh, the coronavirus? Okay, uh, good question. Thanks. Before I get to that, I just I do want to say thanks uh, to the commissary. Uh, I know I live here on base, and we, we go to the commissary all the time, and you know, we'd be in a tough place without it. You know, so just know that uh, all the actions and everything that you're doing over there, and all the employees in there, and it's always professional. The food's good. You know, like, uh, the line to get in. You know, it's, 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 everything's going like clockwork. So I just got to say, nice job. You know, nice job. Uh, keep it that way for us. And that's that's the sort of thing that I think gives us that certainty. There's so much uncertainty out there that having things, you know, like the commissary, or you, I don't have any question that if I'm hungry that I can go to the commissary and get some food. I know it. I know I can. Uh, just as we know with MCCS and a lot of things that they support on space uh, from CBH, uh, I don't have a question that, that I'm going to have that capability for myself or my family members. And that certainty goes a long way in allowing us to be able to focus on our mission. So, again, thanks to both of you guys. Uh, and then to get to your question about what we're doing to safeguard our, our people and, and our equipment, first I'd say, you know, if you think back to before COVID-19 and really as far back as I can remember, certainly before I joined the Marine Corps, uh, is, you know, Thursday is field day. You know, so we're kind of used to, um, on Thursday, we make sure that everything is picked up, organized, generally clean. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean sanitized, you know, but it means everything looks pretty darn good. Uh, and you go to the gear closet and you bust out the mops and the brooms and, and you're making sure everything looks good so that on Friday, you know, when it's time, when Liberty Call sounds, you know, you're ready to walk out the door and you don't have the CEO the sergeant major saying, not yet, you know, we still, this place needs to look ship shape and it doesn't look that way yet. Well, now you fast forward to today uh, and things have changed, you know. Um, now, it's an invisible threat. You can't see it. Uh, so you have to do everything you can to make sure that that threat is not there. And that it is not just organized. I mean, now everything does still remain organized, uh, but now it's sanitized. Uh, so we are burning through uh, cleaning equipment, just as I'm sure folks at home are doing. Uh, but we are burning through cleaning equipment. What used to be a good field day on Thursday, uh, we're burning through roughly 10 times the normal rate because we're cleaning a couple times between shifts. Because not only do we have to keep all of our surfaces uh, clean to make sure that folks don't uh, contract COVID, uh, but also we have multiple shifts. And we purposely put a gap in between, so there's that air gap of distance 
between multiple shifts when they come in. So when there's a few key personnel, the desk sergeants basically, you know, who they know what, these are all the things that we did basically, you know, like say during the day shift, you know, during the, uh, during the day shift, these are the things we accomplished. Those key individuals stick around and they're able to talk via social distancing to the folks who are coming in on the next shift. They uh, also, everyone's scrubbing and cleaning to make sure everything's good. They talk about, hey, this is what we accomplished, this is what still needs to be done tonight. That turnover happens. The rest, the, the masses come in, and then they come in and they conduct those flight operations uh, into into the night. You know, so uh, those are things, you know, just off, the, just off the top of my head that we are doing uh, to try to mitigate uh, that risk. Um, and then we're, we appreciate the, uh, just what the base is doing to assist, you know. Uh, the base has to do these sorts of things as well, the air station. Uh, so they can't put as many flight hours, uh, or they can't sit in the tower, uh, that is, uh, for the same number of flight hours that we've normally been able to enjoy. So then we have to make choices. And so like on Monday and Friday, we, we do more day operations, and then Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we go very heavy you know, into night operations. As I said, we have to maintain what's the toughest for us to do. We have to maintain that capability, and that's flying low light level and night vision devices. Uh, so we have to maintain every single pilot and every single air crew and every single squadron that we have on the flight line has to be able to go out and conduct those operations. So the gist is uh, we're cleaning a lot more than we ever did in the past and we're concentrating on certain skill sets to ensure that uh, our mission readiness is where it needs to be. Thanks, sir. Sergeant Major, so it's apparent that you do a lot of coordination with the other sergeant majors amongst the tenants here on Marine Corps Base Hawaii. What are some of the uh, challenges that you and the uh, fellow sergeant majors are encountering at this point in the COVID fight? You know, that's a good question, sir. And I'll tell you, we our biggest challenge is the individual Marine. And, and that's not you know, a specific rank. When I say that, you know, sometimes we think, you know, Lance, the Terminal Lance or the Lance Corporal. That's not the case. It's, it's the individual Marine, regardless of rank, because even though we're all in this together, it's affected by individual decisions. So preventative health is everybody's responsibility, and if one of us is out there making bad decisions, it affects everyone else. So, you know, a lot of people say that ignorance is bliss. You know, that's a pretty well-known uh, uh, saying. But I'll tell you, ignorance isn't bliss, it's poison. I have a family member who has a degraded immune system because of the medication that they have to take. And I'll tell you, you know, my family, we're on pins and needles about this thing because that, that particular family member, anytime there's, you know, a little sniffle or something that goes around, they, they catch it. So there are four other people in my house that have to be very, very careful about what we do. Now, if we got young Marines or not so young Marines making bad decisions out there, and they're walking around touching everything and, and making bad decisions in public, that dramatically increases my ability of catching that as a carrier. Now, does COVID really impact younger people or people that are in good health? Not as much. So it's entirely likely that I could contract it, and I'm not younger, but I'm still in pretty good health. So, uh, you know, it's entirely possible that I catch it and I carry it home to my family, and that family member actually becomes symptomatic, and we have an ICU visit in our future. You know, think about it like this. Everybody goes to public pools, and most of us don't pee in the public pool. But the one person that does pee in the public pool forces everybody else to swim around in their bad decision. That's what COVID is. If you make a bad decision, you're forcing other people to wallow around in your bad decision, and somebody may get sick because of it. So, you know, be wise out there about your individual actions because it is your individual responsibility. Hey, I, everybody wants to get out of quarantine, but the quicker we start taking this seriously, the quicker we're going to get out of it. So just make good decisions out there, guys. And, and, you know, if you see one of your brothers or sisters, you know, making poor decisions, hey, just reach out and remind them. Hey, you're doing fine, but there are people out there that you're going to pass this to. Because it is absolutely every single person's responsibility on this installation. Whether you're a, a Lance Corporal or a Lieutenant Colonel, make good decisions for yourself, but make them for my family as well, please, because we would appreciate it. Thanks, Sergeant Major. All right, Ms. Baptist, your, your team seems to be in a very interesting position because in many ways they've been grouped into some of those frontline heroes. How are they faring and, and where do they get this sense of teamwork from? Um, our team has been amazing and they really have stepped up, stepped up and become frontline heroes. Um, 
unexpectedly. You know, no one would expect that commissary employees would play such an important role during during a crisis. But um, our our agency did go ahead and um, temporarily uh, deem our store level employees as critical um, mission critical. So um, we're going to be in place throughout this this uh, pandemic. And um, first mo first uh, foremost uh, on as far as management and taking care of our employees is number one. You know the health of of uh, them and their families. Um, we are encouraging them to, to monitor their health if they have any type of health concern. You know if they, they end up with a sore throat, uh, you know low fever, um, if someone in their household has symptoms, or or just even stress. We're encouraging them to stay home and get better. You know we'd much rather see them stay home and get better, recover quickly, and then get back to work. You know after that, then have them get. Um, you know, get in a, a critical situation. So um, that's foremost. And then um, we're, we're, we're creating an environment that is as safe as it can be during this time. So um, I think that the hugest uh, uh, impact was limiting the, the commissary that the 75 individuals or 75 patrons in the store at one time. And, and we did kind of play with those numbers. We, we walked the floor and at one point we were letting, you know, 75 shopping baskets in. And we went back in and brought it back down to the 75. So that, that um, allows our, our employees to have that social distancing um, and, and then also not to be so inundated with workload that, you know, we can't keep up with the, the amount of people that we have. Um, it, we're, we've uh, we sourced hand sanitizer, which is, is challenging to get right now, but we provided it to our our um, employees and encourage them to use it throughout the day in between each customer. Um, and um, uh, we're, we're sanitizing down work areas. Um, we installed the plexiglass sneeze guards um, to get them a little more distance because the register area I think is the most challenging area to create that six foot of social distancing. Um, we're, we're, we're really trying to keep with the every other register being open. Um, and then um, we've discouraged customers to use ca uh, using cash, or we haven't mandated it, but we do encourage them to use credit card or debit cards, and um, just increase the preventative cleaning throughout. So all of these measures have, uh, you know, we've just seen as we put our employees first that um, they feel comfortable that they're, we're there taking care of them and that we have their best interest at heart and um, I think uh, that they're really proud to come to work and to serve the community that they believe in the commissary mission to um, to provide the benefit to the active duty uh, the dependents and the retirees and it uh, and it enhances the quality of life and um, prepares for readiness with the, with the military so I think they really believe in that and and um, sometimes we just, we, we have our meetings and we talk, you know, about the impact of, you know, we all need groceries, right? So the grocery stores can't shut down. And imagine, you know, what would happen if grocery stores shut down, you know? And I think they all understand that and they, they understand their part um, in, in this COVID. So I'm very, very proud of them. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. I'm proud of them. And, um, you know, thankful to work side by side with them through this. Thank you. Colonel Whitefoot, we've talked about your people, the mission, readiness. What have been some of the hardest challenges you've had to tackle currently? Uh, that's a good question. I'd say uh, the first thing that is a little bit of a challenge is that uh, we're writing the book. You know, so we are writing the book on what we need to do on a daily basis. There isn't, uh, you know, Hey, flip open the tab, you know, and let's look at step one is we need to do this, this, and this. You know, it's, hey, as uh, information uh, comes out, and information comes from a lot of different directions, and that's, I think, one of the, the toughest things to tackle is communication. Uh, you can easily get inundated uh, with information, and you can inundate others with information. And so I think distilling the information down to what is important and making sure that the right people know what to do with that information is absolutely critical. Otherwise, you can just get buried, you know, in emails or 
or anything else, you just be reading through all, all kinds of stuff all day long. So, so getting the right people uh, to transfer the communication and information to the right people that need to hear it uh, in a regular fashion that allows them to implement is a challenge and one that we uh, one that we tackle every single day. You know, as, as new information comes down, and we have to implement changes. So I think that um, we have to be smart. Um, we have to not be emotional. You know, it's easy for things when you hear something that's, hey, that's not the way we used to do things. Yep, I think you have to look at it from the perspective of how are, how are we looking at it as MAG24? How is the base looking at it? How is our, our customer? Because we, we, we exist to support the customer, which is Third Marines. When Third Marines need support from MAG24, the answer is yes, unless it has to be no uh, for some reason, uh, safety related or something like that. So it's, we've got to be smart. Uh, and we've got to be not emotional and say, this is why we are doing this or this is why we are not uh, doing this. And so communicating properly. We have to implement good lessons, uh, good ideas and lessons learned, uh, which means you have to know which is which, you know, uh, and make sure that you're only doing the right thing. And the fact that it's a paradigm shift, we can't look to the past and say that's the way we're going to do. I mean, now that we have, uh, you know, I would say, I'm much more a face-to-face -face person than I am. Why don't we get online and, and talk to each other in a chat box? Uh, not a big fan of that, you know, but that doesn't matter. You know, what matters is that we don't spread COVID. And so this new way of communicating is probably something we're going to see in the future uh, for a while. Uh, and I think that that's just one aspect of things is I'll bet that uh, we're going to learn a lot and we're going to, it's going to change our normal habit patterns to a degree that will say, you know what, I think I found another way uh, of operating that, that may help us in the future. So I think the challenge there is, again, communication and just uh, you got to have an open perspective. You know, how is it, what do you need to do, why, and who are you supporting? Uh, Sergeant Major Wells hit on it before. You know, I think that one of the challenges that we have when you start looking at different places um, in, in your organization uh, it's not just on the flight line where we're actually operating aircraft on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's where do those Marines reside. You know, they reside in the squadron and, uh, on a daily basis. But where do they go when, when it's said and done and it's time to recharge your batteries? It's the barracks. You know, so the barracks, I consider the barracks a hot spot. Uh, if, if COVID were to, uh, were to go viral somewhere, it would probably be the barracks, you know, because you have a high density of personnel in one spot. And so, what do we all not like after a period of time? Uh, the same routine, boredom, you know what I mean? We all wanna kinda change things up to some degree, just as human beings, I think we generally, even though we do like routine, uh, we like to change that routine every once in a while. So, my concern is that, as I said, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Not everyone runs marathons for various reasons, uh, but you know that could be, considered boring, you know, running and running and running at the same pace and doing the same thing. I know there's plenty of reasons to like marathon running, but my point is when you do the same thing over and over again, uh, you might get bored with it. And what happens when you get bored with something? Uh, you potentially get complacent and you say, you know what, how long do we have to go before one of us has COVID and so I need to start relaxing my rules. I can have a little more fun. I don't need to wear this mask. I don't need to maintain six feet of social distancing. Uh, I don't need to wash my hands. I'm good. You know, and that is my, my biggest concern is that complacency will, and we're, you figure we are now like what, six weeks into this roughly? Started roughly at the beginning of March for us, and then we started to see real implementation, you know, uh, towards uh, after the first week of March. Um, and we're only, you know, like I said, uh, four or six weeks into this. I think there are some folks who are already a little bit tired of it, uh, and I think more and more folks are going to get tired of it, and that is what I would talk about. Is, don't, don't get tired of it, you know, like figure out what you need to put into your battle rhythm that keeps you sharp, uh, that keeps you, and in aviation, there's a reason we use checklists. Whenever we go and start an aircraft, whenever we go conduct uh, uh, flights, we always follow the checklist because it's when you deviate from the checklist, when you deviate from the things that people have learned over time, that is when things go wrong. So we have to implement lessons learned to make sure we get that communication out to everyone and then we have to make sure that we implement it on a daily basis and don't get complacent. Because once we do that, uh, things will go south quickly for us. So we have to, we have to remain vigilant. And then finally, I think, uh, and I touched on it before, but just the, uh, the challenge is that balance of COVID versus flight operations. 
Uh, we're doing pretty well, COVID right now. We're doing really well, I would say. Uh, knock on wood, because I think that uh, we're not out of the woods. You know, we still got a ways to go. We're not even at the beginning of the peak of the curve yet. You know, we're at uh, where we're supposed to be on the down slope. You know, but um, what we can't afford is a mishap, you know, in any way. Uh, so I'm impressing upon uh, the Marines, sailors, and civilians in Mac 24 that we have got to continue to conduct uh, our aviation business as usual and don't let COVID procedures make us do anything that is unsafe. We need to take the time. If something doesn't seem right, we have to ferret it out. We have to look at it. We have to study it, analyze it, uh, come up with procedures that will make sense so that uh, we continue to operate safely because we have to be ready to fight tonight at all times. That is what we are charged with. We have to be able to do that. I think we are doing that right now. Thanks, Over. Sorry, Major Wells. You uh, mentioned that most of the onus should be put on the individual Marine in terms of combating COVID-19. What would be some advice that you would give young Lance Corporal Wells during this pandemic? Well, that's a good question, sir, because Lance Corporal Wells was uh, wonderfully average. I was an average Lance Corporal. Uh, I was a dangerous Lance Corporal because, you know, Lance Corporals who are not as smart, they, they understand that. So when you tell them something, they tend to listen. I was a pretty smart Lance Corporal. Man, I was an honor grad in my sixth grade class, so I thought I knew it all. So, uh, you know, I made a lot of bad decisions because I thought that I was sharp. And if I were talking to my 19-year-old self, here's some things that I would tell myself today. First of all, wash your hands way more than you're used to. If you should wash your hands an uncomfortable amount of times every day because there's no such thing as too much when it comes to hand washing during a pandemic like this. It's just not, not a thing. So wash them as often as you can. You know, I carry a little bottle of the squeeze bottle of hand sanitizer. Matter of fact, I brought it here with me today. It's laying down there in my cover. So do have some hand sanitizer you carry around, but don't rely, rely on that as your primary means of, of hand sanitation. Wash with soap and water. You know, a lot of people say sing the happy birthday song to yourself. I don't do that. I, I sing like three happy birthday songs because I'm not trying to go down with something like this. Uh, I use that hand sanitizer a lot. You know, all of us are probably used to playing the game the floor is lava when you were a kid, right? Well, during this pandemic, hey, doorknobs are lava. Don't touch doorknobs or anything else that a lot of people have touched. If you can help it, touch it with something else. You know, when I, when I use the head, after I'm finished washing my hands, I dry my hands with those paper towels that we all love so much. I don't throw them away. I take that paper towel and I grab the doorknob with it, then I prop the door up with my foot and then throw it into the trash. So think about little things you can do like that to reduce the amount of contact you have with common items. Things like water fountains, you know? How many people put their hands on that water fountain every day? And I know there's somebody still out there rolling around base putting their mouth on the metal part of the water fountain because somebody there ain't got no home training. So stay away from things that a lot of people touch. I would tell myself that. Don't touch your face. You know, I didn't realize how much I touched my face until I was told I couldn't touch my face anymore. And now it's like a nervous tick. I've got to, I've got to scratch my face every two seconds or it just doesn't feel right. So stay away from your face. Hey, start, start using this right here. You know, maybe use the inside of your blouse if you just have to touch your face. But uh, try to avoid it at all costs. Uh, something that's kind of marine specific. Hey, keep your fingers out of your nose. Now, I know some of you out there are saying, ooh, that's gross, I don't pick my nose. You're a daggum liar. If you are a, I'll tell you, certainly if you're a male Marine out there, I've seen, I have seen you at least once with your fingers in your nose if I've seen you around this base. So keep your fingers out of your nose because germ transition uh, or transmission across mucous membranes is a lot easier than it is across just skin. So you have to be very careful about that. Now, also, don't bite your fingernails. You see, I've got short fingernails, all right? Uh, fancy guys use fingernail clippers. You know, most Marines I know use their teeth. So don't bite your fingernails because germs live underneath your finger fingernails for a very long time. So just stay away from that. Listen to your leaders, especially when they're not around. You know, a lot of us get word passed in the afternoon or we get it in the morning. And then as soon as the, you know, as soon as the platoon sergeant squad leader leaves or gets out of the area, we go back to doing what we were, uh, what we were comfortable doing. Hey, don't make comfort-based decisions. That's not what grown-ups are supposed to do. Now, you see people in mainstream society do it all the time. You're not mainstream society. You're the top 1% or 2%. So don't make comfort-based decisions because that will lead you into trouble. 
Uh, this one, I don't want you to understand what I'm about to say or misunderstand what I'm about to say next. I want you to take it in context. We have very strict controls on this installation that protect you or give you a, quite a bit more protection from germ transmission than they do off base. On base, we have zero active cases of COVID-19. What does that mean to you? That means that you have a lot, uh, a lot greater risk of exposure to COVID-19 off base than you do on base. So my advice to Lance Corporal Wells would be, ah, try, try not to go off base if you can help it. Try to go ahead and hang out on, a, on, our, on our little piece of paradise here on this peninsula. You know, people off base trying to get onto our beaches all the time to surf and hang out because we have a, this may be one of the prettiest parts of the island. People on this peninsula spend all their time trying to figure out how to get off of it. So listen, guys, there's nothing fun to do right now anywhere on Oahu. When the beaches are shut down and they tell you you can't be hanging out out in public, what are you going to do? Well, here, you have two beaches that are open. You have a huge golf course that you can go PT on and you can just enjoy the green grass. Do that. All right, get out there in your little home garage and work out. Many of us have built home garages, and I know that because I cannot find dumbbells in any store. So go ahead and take the dumbbells you've been squirreling away and get your sweat on. So be wise, make good decisions, man. Lance Corporal Wells, don't be dumb. Stay on base. That's what I tell Lance Corporal Wells, sir. And I'll tell you, you know, there's, I, I think it's very appropriate that, that Miss Baptist is here with us today because. Some of you, if you're here and you remember two or three years ago what the commissary used to be like, it was like, uh, it was like going into Beirut in the early 80s in there. And the difference that Miss Baptist and her team has made in our commissary is nothing short of miraculous. So I'll tell you, I, you know what, I live on the other side of the island now, so sometimes we'll go in the NEX over there in that commissary. And it's a big commissary and they've got a lot of stuff. But you know, my wife was on base over here the other day and she said, Hey, I'm going to our commissary because I feel safe there. You know, we complain a lot about the Marine base, but we don't complain about the security, and we certainly don't complain about zero COVID cases. So sometimes, you know what? Your own place is the best place to be, and that's the case here. So go over there and see Holly and her team at the commissary. If there's something that you don't see on the shelves, ask. Ask one of the managers. Pop, pop your head in Holly's office and ask her, because I'm telling you right now, they will do anything they can to get it for you. I don't know any other store on the island that will do stuff like that. So, hey, as much as you can, stay on base and, and stick, with, stick with Marines and Marine family members because it's a little bit safer over here than it is out in town right now. So just be mindful of that. Thanks, sir. All right, so for Ms. Holly Baptist, is there anything else you'd like your customers to know or, or be aware of at this time? So most importantly, it's just that we're working really hard um, to meet the demand, the increase in demand. Um, we're, we've intensified our, our partnership with suppliers. Um, we're, we're fighting to beat other you know, outside stores to get supplies. We're, we're fighting to beat other commissaries on island. You know, I, I have an assistant director who's on the computer daily, and she's, she's working 10 and 12 hour days to to find out what the suppliers got coming in, what's in the pipeline, and to grab it before someone else does. So, um, you know, we, you know, our, we really are passionate about making sure we're meeting uh, the needs of the community. Um, you know, we're uh, there's a few things, but uh, there are so many scenarios out there. So I get daily emails, daily phone calls asking for uh, special shopping hours because of this. Uh, accommodations because of that and um, you know it, it is a challenge and I understand a lot of people are, are in situations right now and they have vulnerabilities unfortunately we can't go beyond what we already have in place just because of you know the workforce and the impact it would have to the rest of the patrons so we're doing our very best um, uh, you know we're with the limited shopping I would say it's just a safe during elderly hours as it is the rest of the day. And the wait time is definitely less the rest of the day than it is during those times. So, um, uh, we don't get, um, I think there, I, you know, I follow the Facebook community feed um, and I think there's a, a misconception that we get shipments and on Monday, you know, uh, we get shipments six days a week. So it's not better to shop on Tuesday than it is on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you know. So, um, you know, just 
for their own um, comfort and not to have, have to stand in line. You know, keep that in mind. Um, a lot of people, uh, you know, afternoon, I, I'm asking customers, they're, they're waiting five minutes as opposed to an hour or so if they come on Tuesday morning. So um, that, but with the, with the 75 people in the building, I would say, you know, they're, uh, you know, the elderly, we're, we are offering that. Just, I, I think at this point it's more of a comfort um, that we're providing that. And, but I don't think it's any safer from not Tuesday and Saturday from 9 to 10 in the morning than it is the rest of the week within the commissary. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're make, we're, we've got the mask now and then, the, uh, you know, we're doing preventative cleaning. We've got our critical hires on board, so we have a little a bit of an overlap of um, the critical hires being on board and our contractor walking out the door. So we're putting them on more stocking, more cleaning, um, so, you know, all those provisions are there. Uh, unfortunately, though, the reality is that we can't provide additional accommodations. What we can say and encourage people to do is, as a community, you know, if you speak to your neighbor, um, it, you know, if you have a neighbor that's, that's expecting um, and feels vulnerable shopping at the commissary, offer to do their shopping, you know, volunteer. At this point, we put into place that uh, our customers can actually um, at the register, like if, a, if I'm volunteering for, for someone else who's a patron, and I'm a patron, I'm, I'm shop, I take their shopping list and I get it at the register, I, the cashier can call the customer that they're shopping for and get their ID number and their credit card. So that's something that the community can step up and kind of feel that, that need that a lot of people have. And it is a valid need, I mean, we have people at home with, with uh, asthma, we have people who have had open heart surgery, um, you know, and the elderly community, uh, you know, is huge. So, um, if, you know, it would just be, it's a great opportunity to be able to step up. So just asking the community just to be aware, you know, of, of uh, other community needs um, within that and that provision that they can, you know, um, they wouldn't have to exchange cash or bring the customer's credit card, but we can provide that at the register um, during this time only. Um, Lastly, uh, you know, everything that the customer does to support our team, whether it's bringing in shopping carts right now, um, limiting their shopping time, because that really does help move the line a lot quicker. Uh, I know everyone wants to get out of the house, and it's like, oh, I'm out of the house. I think I'll linger at the commissary for, for some time. And also, they are buying more groceries, but if they could... Just keep in mind, the quicker they can get in and out, the quicker others can get in. Um, and then most importantly, showing compassion and appreciation to our staff, whether it's with attitude um, or in word, and also to other customers. You know, I had a customer in there two days ago, and um, her father-in-law had just passed away of COVID uh, out on the East Coast. And you know, these are sensitive times for people. You know, the more, uh, we meet each other with compassion and understanding. I think it's just going to have a huge impact in how we get through it. So. Thank you, Holly. And I think with that, we've hit all of the main topics and questions that were out there in the information environment. So I'd like to take the time, Colonel Lightfoot, thank you, Sergeant Major Wells, Ms. Holly Baptist, really appreciate your time and your insights. Thank you. Thank you.